Hi, it's Lois here, back again with part 4 of the dual tutorial teaching you the basics of GIMP whilst at the same time showing you how to create some great Facebook timeline cover and profile images. As promised, I'm going to continue where I left off at the end of part 3 and finish Sue's cover and profile image. Then there's a new template for you to make. Then I'm going to show you another example where I'm going to be putting a photo of myself over part of an old painting. And before I go, I'll be showing you how to change the colourways of a few patterns. Remember the Facebook blue and grey? Right, let's get started. I'm going to skim through finishing Sue's cover and profile image quickly as part of the introduction. I've since worked out a better way that I'll go through more slowly afterwards. OK, I decided to rotate this image slightly and then I took a selection to straighten the side edges, reduced the width to 851, preserving the aspect ratio, and imported a copy of the template I created in part 1 and pasted it in as a new layer. I decided where I wanted to place it and then took the selection out from the larger image. Now this bit I would like to explain to you, as it's a really handy tip. If I make the template the active layer and then go to select all, as soon as I make the image the active layer, the selection's gone. Instead, the select all now applies to the image. OK, I'm making the template layer the active layer again and going to get the fuzzy select tool. When I click in an empty part of the template, as you probably expected, all the transparent areas have been selected but not the white areas. But if I push the threshold all the way as far as it will go to 255, the whole template area is selected, the transparent and the white parts. And because that was a selection with one of the tools, when I make the image the active layer again, the selection remains. It isn't tied to the template layer in any way. So now we can take out the 851 by 315 section that we want to use as a cover. This will work with the Select by Colour tool as well. Right, what I did was cut it out rather than copying it, then File Create from Clipboard. I then pasted the template in as a new layer and used the image canvas size to add an extra 22 pixels to the bottom by changing the 315 to 337. Then I grabbed the piece from underneath the selection I cut out and pasted that in too. Moved it with the Move tool to match it up with the cover image selection. Then I made the template layer invisible and merged the two layers. Then I got the rectangle select tool and used fixed size rather than the fixed aspect ratio. I set it to 160 by 160. Use the X rather than the colon for the fixed size. I clicked and then moved the selection to fit perfectly inside the profile image frame on the template. Then I copied that selection from the image. And that's a background to Sue's profile image. But remember you can't upload a 160 by 160 image, it has to be at least 180. I changed that using the scale image tool. And then scaled down the cutout I made of Sue, copied and pasted it into the background. I got rid of the images I didn't need and readjusted the height of the cover image using the canvas size tool again. There was just one more step I needed to take care of. I uploaded the cover image to my own account and when I paste the profile image in place you can see that shadow gradient I mentioned in part 3. It's not too bad in this image but you can see it if you look at the grass area behind Sue. I fixed that using the blend tool, but I'll speed that up here because I'm going to show you how to make a template for this too so that you have it for whenever you want to use this technique again. And this is what I ended up with. I've added text here too, but as I've already said, I'll be covering the text tool in part 5. So now for that template. OK, remember in part 1 when we uploaded the black images to make it easier to get the template? Well, we're going to do that again, but this time use white images. And this is what you'll end up with. I've taken a screenshot and opened it in GIMP. I'm just clearing the profile image area using the fuzzy select and rectangle select tools and the delete key on the keyboard. Grab the fuzzy select tool again and select the empty area. Then edit, copy, file, create from clipboard. It's actually 168 pixels rather than 160 because the 4 pixel white borders merged in with it, but that's fine. Now fill the area with white and then paste in the selection you just took 
and make it into a new layer. Keep that layer on top. And here's the tool we're going to use, the Blend tool. Now the default is foreground to background, but if you click here you'll find lots of other options. And the one we want is foreground to transparent. Take the Rectangle Select tool and make a selection across the profile image area that's roughly the same height as the gradient used by Facebook. Go back to the Blend tool, make sure you have black as the foreground colour and also that that transparent layer is the active layer. And then going from the bottom to the top of your selection, using the edge of the profile area to help you keep a straight line, click and take the tool to the top of the selection, then let go. Only the profile area is filled here because we're adding the gradient to that transparent layer that's only 168 pixels square. Now making sure the top layer is the active layer, adjust the opacity of the layer here like this until you feel that it roughly matches up with the Facebook gradient. Once you're happy, select all, edit copy and file create from clipboard and you have your template. But you remember you can't upload anything as your profile image smaller than 180 by 180 so I'm just using image scale image to change that and you're done. I'm just going to put a white layer underneath and save it as a PNG just to show you how it looks on my page. I'm happy with that. It may be a tiny bit dark at the bottom, but you can play around until you get it spot on. So I'm going to save that now. Remember to make sure you save it as a PNG and not a JPEG or the transparency won't be preserved. Or you can just use save as and keep it as an XCF file if you like. And then just as with the template in part one, I'm saving a few copies so I don't lose it and have to do it again. And before I finish here, I'm just going to show you that if I increase the size to 500 pixels and save that as another test file, when I upload it, you can see that it looks just the same as the 180 pixel image. So you can scale it to any size you want if you want a larger profile image. And that's it. Right, now let's get to work using it. This is the image of the painting I'm using. I got it from historian Steve Grindley's Flickr stream. And there's a link to both his page and the license in the video description below. In case anyone who knows the Sydenham area is watching this, the view is down Kurtzell from near the junction with Charlcote Grove and that's St Bartholomew's Church in the background that stands on Westwood Hill, which is the road I live on. And this is a photo of me at the Derby Houses in Colbrookdale, Shropshire, dressed as a Victorian in September 2009. I'm quite glad now that it was suggested to me that I remove my non-Victorian earrings. First, I want to show you what happens if I upload the unedited original image of the painting. I can't scroll it from side to side because Facebook has reduced the width to 851 to force it to fit, but I can scroll it up and down. With this image it would be okay if we weren't matching it up with the profile background because I can scroll it until it looks pretty good. I will be dealing with images you want to use that don't work because the part you want to show is too big to fit into the window in part 5. OK, load your original image and a copy of the template you created in part 1 into GIMP. Go to the template and add a new layer. Make the template layer active and we're going to use the Select by Colour tool with the lowest threshold. Click in the empty space in the template. And I'm selecting a grey colour here but any colour is fine. And then make the top layer active and you want Edit Fill with Foreground Colour to fill all the selected areas with the colour you chose. And now we're going to reduce the opacity of that layer with this box here. Take it down to roughly halfway. Then make the template layer active again and use the fuzzy select tool to click in the profile image area and then use the bucket tool to fill that selected area with the grey colour. The next step is to merge the layers and then we want to copy the layer. 
so select all, edit copy. Then open your original image and paste it in as a new layer like this. And as you can see by adding the transparent colour, it's easier to see what part of the image you'll be selecting. It is a bit too small, isn't it? You can see just how much Facebook reduced the image in size now. We have two choices here, either make the template bigger or the image smaller. I'll do the former here. Get the width of your image up at the top of the window here, or you can check it using the scale image tool. Right click on the template layer, select scale layer, and change the 851 to the width of your image. Or choose a smaller size if you don't want to use the whole width of the image. I do because I want to be able to fit as much of the detail of the painting in as possible. Then move the template into position. I'm just zooming in here so that I can make sure that it's lined up at the sides. So make sure the template layer is active and select move the active layer over here. Click once anywhere in the image and then use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move the template one pixel at a time. It's now lined up on that side, and here if I hit the left arrow key, it should reveal just one pixel. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Then I'm going to zoom back out and use the up and down arrows to choose just what part of the painting I want to go for. The opaque profile area shows me what will be hidden. Unfortunately, that will be the man on the donkey. <laughs> Once you're happy, you're ready to cut your selection out of the image you're using. Grab the Select by Colour tool. Push the threshold all the way up to 255. Click anywhere in the template layer. Actually, I'm going to scale the image down. You don't have to do this if you want people to see a larger image when they click on your cover. But I'm going to do it with this one. If you want, you can just skip this step. I'm going to take the width right down to 851. Then I'll zoom in so I can see more. And as you can see, the template is still selected even after scaling the image. So making sure that the image is the active layer, copy it and open it in a new window. And you can see here that the height is the 315 that we want. Even after enlarging the template and then reducing the image and template down. So save an XCF copy so you have it to work with if Facebook makes it necessary or if you decide to make any changes later. Now we're going to get the background for the profile image. You want the rectangle select tool with a fixed aspect ratio of 1 to 1. Make your selection over the profile area and then fit it precisely within the white border like this. Then make sure the image is the active layer, copy the selection and open it in a new window. <laughs> I am a bit sad about that donkey, so I'm quickly making another cover and profile background image where the donkey and his rider can feature. Now we're going to assemble the profile image, which we've already done all the work for. So opening GIMP, I have the image of me minus the background, the selection we took from the painting, that donkey's making me nervous now. If you remember this was only 160 pixel square because I reduced the width of my original image. I've scaled it up to 330 pixels, which is the same size as the cutout image of me. And I have a copy of the shadow gradient template we made, which I'm just going to scale up to 330 now. So long as your finished square image is 180 pixels or larger, it will work and be positioned perfectly in line with the rest of the picture used as your cover image. All there's left to do is copy and paste the gradient over the background, and then copy and paste the cutout image of yourself into another new layer. And then save it as either a PNG or a JPEG but do also save and keep an XCF version so that if you need to change things, you don't have to start from scratch. If Facebook changed the position of the profile pic yet again, you will need to create a new template, take the new selection from your cover image, but if you save this as an XCF file, you can simply import and rescale, if necessary, the shadow layer and the top layer of yourself, and you won't have to start everything again from scratch. I'll be highlighting more benefits of keeping your original work in part 5. 
Okay, just gonna quickly upload these to give you confidence that it really does work. And as you can see there, the profile background lines up perfectly with the cover image. And I also created this version. If you prefer this look, or you want to use an existing cover image and don't have the rest of the image, you can leave the bottom of the background of your profile image white. I'm sure you'll be able to work out how to do this, but if you do want me to do a quick tutorial on it, just let me know by leaving a comment on this video. And just to clarify things, I have these examples for you. I don't recommend you ever using an image for your cover photo that's either less than 851 wide or 315 high, but more about that in part 5. Here in the top example the cover is 851 by 315 and the profile is a 330 pixel square. In the next example down I've used the same cover but the profile is a 214 pixel square and at the bottom I've used a cover image of 1400 by 518 and the profile is 263 and as you can see they all look fine and the profiles all line up with the cover image and this is what the 330 pixel profile image looks like when your friends click on it I also uploaded a 180 pixel version which looks like this when someone clicks on it I use that size if I'm using an image that I'm not that fond of just because it goes with the cover and I use a larger image if I'm happy with the picture. Now for those lovely patterns. Right, I'm just going to open GIMP here and the first thing I'm going to show you, although you may already have worked it out for yourself by now, is how to open multiple images from the GIMP window. Go to the file menu and click on open. I have the folder I want open here, but if not, just navigate to it in this open image dialog box. And here are the images I want to open. I grabbed these images from the Fashion Wallpaper website where they have lots of designs from all sorts of companies, not just the Morris & Co designs. They kindly gave me permission to use their images in this tutorial, as long as I left a link to their website. So you'll find that in the description to the video. If I click on the bottom image and then hold in the shift key on the keyboard and click on the top image, they'll all be selected. And then when I click on this open button, they'll all open in the program. Now, let me see, I'll use this one for the demonstration as it has more than just two colors. And if we go to the colors menu, you'll see all the tools that you're going to be using, some of which I've covered already in the tutorial when I was working with photographs. Color balance, hue saturation, colorize, and brightness and contrast. I'll begin with the colorize tool, as I haven't covered that one yet. As you can see, this has made the image different shades of just one color. And if I slide the hue control here, I can change the color like this. I'm going to go for a purple here to show you how I created the papers for my purple and gold Christmas decorations. I will be putting up a collection of videos showing how I made all the decorations once I actually get to make them. You can then play around with the saturation and the lightness controls to get the effect you're looking for. And once you're happy, just click OK to make the changes to the image. I'm using the tool a second time here to get an even richer effect. Because this is just one colorway and we have some distinct paler sections, I'm going to take advantage of that to add in some gold color to the design. I'm adding a new layer here so that my additions to the image are able to be edited separately to the main image. Then I'm using the select by color tool. I don't want any feathering here and I'll leave the threshold as it is at the moment at 15. Then I'm going to click in a paler area like this. You can zoom in to see more clearly what areas have been selected by the tool. Okay, I think I'll increase the threshold a little. I'm going to try 18. And then just click in a pale area again. And yes, I'm happy with that. I'm going to go and find a gold colour, which I have here. I'll be covering the colour selection dialog in a bit more detail in part 5. And then I'm making that new layer the active layer. Then edit, fill with foreground colour. And then I'm just going to get rid of the selection using select and none and you can see the result. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? But because the gold is in another layer, I can edit that without affecting the purple background layer. I can change the transparency of that layer and then use the hue saturation tool, 
where if I select the yellow option, I can now change the hue, the lightness and saturation of the color. I prefer that and I'll just toggle here to show you the original and then the edits I made to the design. Okay, let's use the hue saturation tool on the original design now. You can see here if I select the blue that nothing happens with the image at all. There's just no blue in it. So if I change the hue or whatever controls I use, nothing happens. But if I select red, I can now change the hue of the red areas without affecting the other colors in the original like this. And you can start to get an idea here just how many different effects are possible. Then I can edit the yellow areas in the same way. And here's what happens when you use the master setting. Oh, blue, bluey, greeny, teal shades are one of my favourites. I did make the colours very similar there, didn't I? I usually go for just one or two colours with most things. So I'll use it all again without doing that to highlight just how many options you have. Millions. And I can, of course, further edit the image with any of the other tools. Here I'm using the brightness and contrast. So if you're into crafts such as card making, picture framing, website designing, this this could go on forever. Remember that you can do this. I had a gift wrap of the perfect design but wrong colourway for my purpose. Scanned it in, used GIMP to edit it to the colours and shades I wanted. It was a small gift I was giving so it ended up wrapped in my edited design and then the same paper was used in the greetings card I made. If this sounds exciting to you, um, look out for my Christmas decoration videos and you'll find there I'll be using a fixing spray that can even make your paper designs glossy. And now we'll take a look at the color balance tool. And I'm going to use the cyan to red control here just to show you the differences between what happens with the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. I do love colors. I could and often do play around for hours with these tools in GIMP. My favorite Christmas present when I was a child was when my parents would include a tin of Caran oil crayons in my pillowcase. I love the smell and the colors and all the other gifts would just be ignored as I sat rearranging the crayons in the tin. Enough reminiscing, let's get on with the show. I want to quickly show you colour curves, because I do love using this tool. You don't need to understand too much about it to have a play around. I'm going to select the red channel, and then just bend the line with the mouse like this. And I can then select the green channel and do the same. And don't forget that you can use one tool after another. Go on, admit it. You wanted me to try the sign there too, didn't you? Okay, I won't spoil all the surprises and I'll leave you to have a play with the rest of the tools yourself. Right, what about that Facebook blue and grey? I'm going to go and get a screenshot of my Facebook page, import it into GIMP, select those colours and then return to our image, add a new layer and put a block of each of those colours onto the second layer like this. They're just there so that I can see what my design looks like against them. Then I make the pattern, the active layer again, and I'm going to use the colorize tool to get something close to that blue, like this. Then I'll use the select by color tool as I did earlier and fill those paler areas with the gray color in a new layer. And then when I'm done, I make the layer with the color blocks invisible, merge the other two layers, and then copy and paste the edited pattern into the screenshot so I can see what it looks like on the Facebook page. And if I want, I can perform further edits to that layer there until I'm happy with the effect. And here are some others I did earlier. I did these to use one as a background to one of my existing Facebook covers. So I can add them all to the screenshot and then choose which one I want to use. OK, I'm going to get rid of all these files and then show you how I created an area of pattern large enough to use as a cover background. I'm opening a new image. No idea why I thought we wouldn't be doing this again when I recorded part one and I'm making it more than twice the width and height of the cover image. I'm opting for 2000 by 1000 here. Then I'm copying the edited pattern and pasting it into the new image. It isn't snapping to the edge. Now, where is that? Um, yeah, under view. Click where it says snap to canvas edges. I'm positioning the pattern at the top left, then duplicating the layer. I'm gonna zoom in so I can see what I'm doing. And the selection hasn't been created so that it tiles. So I'll reduce the opacity of the second layer and then position it like this using the arrow keys. And then duplicate that layer. Make the current layer fully opaque again and position the next layer. And so on. 
once I've almost filled the space across the top and all the layers are opaque, I'm going to make the background layer invisible and merge the other layers and then duplicate that, reduce the opacity and position it underneath and then merge the layers again. Select the Rectangle Select tool to a fixed size of 851 by 315 and then I can take my selection. And because I made the area so large, I can scale it down if I want. So I can have my background with a smaller version of the pattern. And that's it. I'll be using the background in part 5 which is all about text, colour selection and the myriad of reasons to always save an XCF version of your work as you go. See you there!